Paul White. I'm very excited to tell you about a brand new offer that we have here available at our ministry. We have placed all of our 2013 sermons on one flash drive and we're making that available to you. It is included in the 2013 sermon collection. And in that collection is every sermon that we ministered on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights right here at Midland. And it also includes all of my guest speakers throughout the entire calendar year of 2013. And as an added bonus, we have included all six of the Salvation 101 sermons. Now those are not previously available on CD. That was a DVD collection that's been used on international television. We took those sermons and made them audio available files on this flash drive. So you can get all of the sermons from the entire year plus that on one drive for $100. Now why this is an appealing deal, I believe, is because you can take these sermons and you can do whatever you want with them. If you'd like to make CD copies so you can use in different places in your house, your car, whatever, that's great. Or if you got a particular sermon you love, make as many copies as you want, give them to your friends. What a great way to spread the gospel of grace. You can get your copy of the 2013 Sermon Collection by going to our website, which is on your screen, by calling our toll-free number, and donate using Visa, MasterCard, Discover, or you can also purchase it via PayPal. Whatever way you choose, we'll get it out to you as fast as possible, and I believe it's going to be a great addition to your Christian library. Grace and peace. meant by the term salvation? And what are some ways to effectively share your faith with others? Pastor Paul White was recently asked to submit six 30-minute sermons aimed at an audience of unbelievers in order to introduce them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. These sermons are currently airing on an international Christian satellite network with a potential audience of over one billion people. 
Now you can own these six sermons on DVD as study tools for effective evangelism. Or share them with friends and loved ones who need to hear the good news about God's love and Christ's sacrifice. This six DVD set can be yours for only $30 plus $5 shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or order online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. Sermon so much that it got trimmed down a few times. Uh, and I, and it, the last few months, I realized we've been in the new campus. We do the Sunday mornings only, and we do our water baptisms on Sunday morning. But I hadn't preached water baptism in so long, and it really began to press on me late last year that we get an opportunity to preach water baptism, that we ought to do it through the lens of understanding what we know about the New Covenant. And so I'm very excited today because though most of you have been baptized by water, maybe all of you have been baptized in water, I think there's still something for us to learn about the New Covenant by understanding what water baptism is all about because water baptism is a very, very, it's an ancient rite, but a very important rite of the New Covenant Church. And I want to try to explain why I think it's so important today. Uh, My title this morning has to do with what I believe baptism is. It's the baptism of identification. It, just like your thumbprint or your DNA identifies who you are, water baptism gives you, the believer, and identification of who you are. One of the things that I think we did that was a little misleading for years about water baptism is that we would say things like, water baptism is a public profession of your faith. It's a testimony to everybody else that you're saved. What that did was that made water baptism all about the audience rather than about the person being baptized. I think that was a mistake. Your water baptism has nothing to do with the audience. Okay? Your water baptism is a personal identifier about who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. So what I want to establish today is what that identity is and how we come about that identity. I also want to bring out that water baptism, in a a lot of respects, if you really want to get a a good grasp on this topic, start with communion. See, because we do a lot of communion at Midland, and we do a lot of communion talking, a lot of communion sermons where you probably have a pretty good grasp on the body and the blood of your Lord Jesus Christ. Hopefully, you're, you're celebrating communion, not even just once a month here, but maybe even at home or wherever. And you're doing it knowing that it's bread and it's juice or it's a cracker and wine or whatever you use. But you're also taking it saying, this is His body broken for me. This is His blood shed for me. Think of water baptism in the same terms. It's a physical... Symbol. It is something that you do, just like you take communion, that has a spiritual identifier. What is that wafer? Well, it's a wafer, but what is it? By faith, the body of Jesus. What is that cup? Well, it's a cup, but what is it by faith? Well, it's identified with the blood of Jesus. You don't, we don't get into semantics over whether or not it's the real body and the real blood. If you do, I think you're missing the point, although some get into that battle, that argument. But the, part, the purpose of communion is to un- have an understanding. Now, I, my whole life, water baptism in some circles was a real fighting topic. People would say, and this is a question that was asked a lot, are, can you really be saved if you're not baptized? Is someone really a Christian that accepts Jesus by faith, but they're never baptized, are they really a Christian? I heard that argument every, every which way. That was always a contention between certain denominations, too, is that was a real fighting point. Was how do you, not only were you baptized, but then there was other circles that said, how were you baptized? Were you baptized all the way? Were you sprinkled? What words did they say over you when you were baptized? Did they baptize you in the name of Jesus? Did they baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Did they baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost? There was all these different ways. When you came up out of the water, did you come up speaking in tongues? Did you come up shouting? Did you come up and feel different? There was all kinds of fights over what constituted real baptism. I heard all of them. The basic core of it was, can you be saved and not be baptized? I never heard anybody argue, ever, Anybody argue, can you be saved and not take communion? Nobody ever argued that. Which is interesting to me because we would use scriptures from the Gospels where Jesus would say, a man must believe and be baptized to be saved. 
we'd use scriptures from Matthew that said, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we'd say, see, Jesus told you to be baptized. But nobody ever quoted John 6 where Jesus said, unless a man eat my flesh and drink my blood, he doesn't have any part in me. Now, why in the world didn't we ask the same question about communion that we were asking about water baptism? And I think it's because we had a better grasp on communion as being symbolic of an identification of something else than we did water baptism. We made more of an issue of water baptism because we didn't see water baptism as an identifier. So where I want to take you today is exactly where my title says we're going. The identification of baptism, knowing that what it means. And maybe before we're done today, somebody in this room will say, you know what? I think I'd like to be baptized again. Now, the reason I say this, not because you're, it's going to hit you in the middle of the sermon. I'm not even saved. No. But maybe somewhere in this, you start to realize, wow, when I was baptized, I didn't see any of that. I didn't, I didn't see that as an identification. To me, it was just something we did, and I didn't even understand it. And maybe it's time for us to reevaluate this. Let's start here, because in the first few passages we're going to use, I'm going to establish three basic things that are the very heartbeat of this message. Okay, And the very first thing we want to find out is, what does it mean to be justified. How, how is a man justified? Let's start in Romans chapter 3. The Apostle Paul says, and we're reading the NIV today. Let's start in the 28th verse and watch what Paul maintains. I think the old King James or the new King James says, we thus conclude. We maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Midland, let me ask you a question. Based upon the Apostle Paul's writing in Romans 3, where does justification come from? Justified by faith. A man is justified by faith, and please notice, apart from the works of the law. So, my justification is framed by my faith. It is not framed by my works. No work that I can do under any semblance of law can justify me. Justification is not a word we use every, in everyday vernacular in America. I want you to imagine the, the legal system. If you are justified in a court of law, the, the, then you've been declared free. You've been declared innocent. There is no judgment against you. The judge justified you. What Christ has done is died so that there's no judgment against humanity. You access that justification by faith apart from the works of the law. Verse 29. Or is God, here's the counter argument, if it's not by faith, then is God the God of the Jews only? Is He not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. Why would Paul put this question in there? Because if justification came by the law, who had the law, Jews or Gentiles? Jews. If justification came by the law, then what's the Gentiles supposed to do? They're too bad. Short on luck, born in the wrong bloodline. And that's what a Jew thought of a Gentile. If a Jew would have said to a Gentile, short on luck, born in the wrong bloodline. Sorry, we're special, we're better. That was the mentality. Paul comes along and says a man justified by faith. It's got to be apart from the works of the law, because if it's not apart from the works of the law, then God likes Jews more than he does Gentiles. And we know that must fly in the face of who God really is, because we know Jesus died for the sin of the whole world. Verse 30. Since there is only one God, who will justify... This is not a question. I posed that phrase, who, as if it was going to be a question. Scratch that. Since there's only one God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith? One God. Why bring up that there's one God? Because there needs to be more than one God if some people are going to get justified by being Jewish and then others are going to have to do a whole different thing to be justified by being Gentiles. Then there needs to be two gods because God needs to do the same thing for everybody. He can't have different sets of rules. If there's different rules, there's a different God. So Paul's basically establishing one God, monotheistic. He is still the God of Israel, but he's also the God of everybody that's not an Israelite through one thing. Justify the circumcised by faith, that's a Jew, and the uncircumcised, look at this last phrase, through that same faith. So there's nothing that separates a Jew from a Gentile in salvation. Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So when you place your faith in who Jesus is, Paul said you're justified. You don't even need to know the law. You don't have to be under the law, much less know the law, to be considered justified. So what happens when we believe? Let's jump ahead in Paul's same book. 
to Romans chapter 6, verse number 3. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Good question. Don't you know it? Well, you and I seem like we know it. But let's stop there for a moment and assume that we don't and try to figure out what Paul means. When we were baptized into Jesus Christ, we were baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. Now, did you physically get up on a cross 2,000 years ago and die with Jesus? No. Okay, simple. That, that, that didn't, you didn't even really have to be paying attention to answer that question right. But you are paying attention, and you realize that Paul's not asking you if you physically got on a cross and died with Jesus. He's asking you, have you identified with having got on a cross and died with Jesus? Don't you know that when you were baptized into Jesus Christ, baptized is from the Greek word baptismo, when you were baptized into Christ Jesus, and it's to be immersed in something, okay? If, it's, if, it's, if you're at a river and you're baptized, you're immersed into water. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. You didn't really go and die. I mean, you weren't even born yet. But you went and died. How? Because you were baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. Verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So we were therefore buried with him through baptism. You didn't really go into a tomb and lay there three days, but when you were baptized, you had the identification of going into the tomb with Jesus, of coming up out of the water, the same as Jesus raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so that when you come up out of the water, you can walk in a new life. Verse 5. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, this is a fascinating phrase, you were united with Him in a death like His. You're not going to die on a cross. But your death was like his. How? In that you identified that when he went down, you went down. When he went into a grave, you went into a grave. If we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. Looking forward to a physical resurrection, but also a spiritual resurrection where you came up out of the water, you came up out of the grave, and a new life lives inside of you. Verse 6. For we know, and this is our concluding verse in this passage. Now watch this. We know, please catch that third word. We know, this is a mental thing, that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Look at that. By God's grace, we should no longer be slaves to sin. Like Robin was speaking to us a moment ago, so appropriate, so in preparation for this message too. That those who have come in by faith ought to know this. Now that you've come in by faith, your old man has been crucified. You're a new man in Christ. There's no reason for you to be dominated by the old sin that used to define you. And one of the difficult things for people to grasp under grace, under a new covenant, because we're so sin conscious rather than Jesus conference, or as I like to say, we're so sin conscious rather than Savior conscious. I, I think I said this Wednesday night, I am so sick and tired of talking about sin in the church. It, it defined every song, sermon, Sunday school lesson, the church I grew up, I'm all of us, we grew up in church, all you ever talk about is sin. And I, I'm so much more excited about Jesus. And that's what we are as Christians. Christ is the focal point of who we are, not sin. Uh, if we would focus more on Christ, I think there would be less sin. We're focusing so much on sin, there's less Christ. There's almost less Jesus available because we're so focused on sinning, not sinning, not sinning, making sure people aren't sinning, figuring out the newest sin on the block, how to name the latest sin. Have you heard what they're doing now? And then trying to find a verse to figure out what sin it is. It's incredible. Instead of just being about Jesus. I don't want Christians to sin. I know God doesn't want them to sin either. But the reality is, is why God went to such great extents, even in the New Testament, talking about you being free from sin, is not because when you sin, you lose your righteousness, but because you're, when you sin, you do such a poor job advertising who you are to everybody watching. And they don't get a good impression of Jesus because all they see is somebody acting like them. 
So believers ought to want to stop sinning because it's so beneath them. Look at that. You're not a slave to sin anymore. Why would you want to go act like a slave now that you're a prince? So here's the breakdown of what we've just seen. Next screen. Number one, there's three things. Number one, we were crucified with him when he died. Not just believers. The entire world. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5. We thus conclude that if one man died, all men died. That's a conclusion. We thus conclude that if one man died, all men died. Okay? So, drill this in your spirit. We were crucified with him when he died. Man does not need to undergo a spiritual death. He has already had his spiritual death met in the body of Jesus at Calvary's cross. The vilest sinner you can think of today. The vilest of sinners has already had their sin paid for at the cross. Do you believe that? I do. I don't think that a sinner needs to come in and pay penance. You come in and meet Jesus. We don't give you a list. of somebody going, Boy, you were really bad. We know you by reputation. So here's what you need to do. Now, if people do that to you, it's because they are uncomfortable and they want you to please them. But that is not for your salvation. And my advice would be to run as far as you can from it personally. But everyone's death was in his death. We were crucified with him when he died. Number two. And we'll leave them both up there. We were justified when we believed. This is crucial. Everybody was crucified in Christ. In other words, Jesus paid for everybody. There is not a sinner alive that Jesus didn't pay for. And everybody said, <laughs> I know you believe that. It, see, when we word it a little different, people go, oh, well, I buy that. A lot of people have trouble with his death was my death. But when you say Jesus died for everybody, they all say amen. So we'll say it the way to make people amen. Jesus died for everybody. Amen. Praise God. Believe that. Okay. His death was their death. His death was their death. They don't need to die. He's already died. But number two, they're not justified until they believe. Now, how do we know that? Because we just read it in Romans 3. He said, finally, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So what would happen if a man didn't put his faith? He's not justified. Simple. I think it's pretty simple. We make it a little tougher. Justification comes by faith. Man doesn't get justified by what he does. He gets justified by who he believes in. So we were crucified with him when he died. That doesn't mean everybody's saved. What do you need to do in order to be justified? You need to believe. So number two, we were justified when we believed. Let's drop water baptism into the mix. Number three, we identify with that death and that resurrection at our baptism. We identified with it. In other words, he, he forgave me and paid for my sins when he died on the cross. Then one day I found out about it. And I had to make a decision, believe or don't believe. So I believed. And the moment that I believed, he justified me from everything. He said, I'll justify you, Paul, based on your faith. And then my water baptism was my moment of identifying with two very important things about Jesus, his death and his resurrection. You see, I can be saved simply by my faith, but my baptism identifies me, not identifies me to the world as a believer. I think that's where we cheapened baptism, because we always just said it's public profession of your faith, which when I was growing up was redundant. The reason it was redundant was we would bring you to an altar and make you have a public profession of your faith when you quote unquote got saved. Somebody had to pray with you. You had to pray out loud. You could not get saved without praying out loud. You had to pray in a public place. Somebody needed to see it. That was your testimony of salvation. So guess what water baptism became? Just redundant. I mean, you already testified out loud that you were saved. So, and then we get up and go, now this is your public profession of faith. Well, I thought that was last Sunday morning. I, you had me come up front and kneel down at a bench. That was my public profession of faith. And I think we had such a pitiful understanding of what baptism was, which was really for the person being baptized to have an identification. I have went down into the grave with him, and now I raise up in a newness of life with him. I am not who I used to be. He, he died for my sins at the cross. I identified with it when I believed, but now I know exactly who I am in Christ. Why do you take communion? It's to identify with the body and the blood of Jesus. Now, you know about the body and the blood of Jesus, so why bother? Because Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember me. He didn't say, as often as you get baptized, remember me. So it's not something we do every month, come up here and everybody get re-baptized or re-identify. 
But when you give your heart to Christ, it's an identification of who I am in Jesus. And I honestly believe that a big reason why a lot of people get saved, and I, I'm always hesitant to use the phrase get saved because we so cheapen that. But the moment that people believe and become justified by faith, a big reason why a lot of them go out and they don't live any different. Is this, is a, is this a problem in the church? Well, it happens. People come in and quote unquote get saved, go out, don't do anything different than they did before they quote unquote got saved. They're not in church in three months. We don't see them again. So you go, why in the world is this the case? Because I don't think we're identifying our new creation through the waters of baptism. I think we have an erroneous idea of what happened to us when we got saved. Let, let, let's try to break this down because I want to see where this came from. Baptism. Because if you try to establish water baptism in Genesis through Malachi, you're going to have some problems. You, you know what I mean? You're, gonna, you're really going to struggle to find Ezekiel lining people up next to the river Kabar. He's at, he's at Kabar in the first chapter of Ezekiel, and he has revelations. But he doesn't line people up and start baptizing them. You go, what, where did John the Baptist come up with this idea? Because he's the first guy we see wholesale baptizing people in the Bible, and that's not until the Gospels. So what were they doing in the Old Testament to lead this? We didn't have much. We got, we've got Naaman, the Syrian, coming to the house of Elisha and asking to be healed of leprosy. And Elisha says, go down to the Jordan and dip seven times. That's the closest thing we've got to baptism. That guy's not even a Jew. And he's not dipping to get, quote unquote, saved. He's dipping to get healed. Because under the Old Covenant, healing was the apex anyway. Now, the closest thing they had to washings was ceremonial cleansing, where, you, where the priest went in and washed his hands in the, in the brazen laver and washed his feet in the brazen laver to wash the blood off and wash the dust off of his feet. And, and Israelites would have ceremonial washings where they would, if they touched a dead body, they would kill a red heifer and burn its ashes up and sprinkle it in water, and they would wash themselves in the ashes of a red heifer so that they would be cleansed from the defilement of a dead body. That was, that was as close as they got to baptism. And then John comes along, John the Baptist. We call him the Baptist because he was baptizing people. And John the Baptist is baptizing people by his own admission into a baptism of repentance. Now, what is repentance? It's the Greek word metanoia, but what does it mean? Change your mind. So what's John getting people to do? Change their mind. And every time he baptizes people, he explains them what he wants them to change their mind about. He says there's a kingdom coming. There's a king in that kingdom coming. I want you to repent, repent. Repent and be baptized. Change your mind and be baptized into a new reality. There's a guy coming after me who's preferred before me. Change your mind and get baptized into a new reality. I'm not worthy to take this guy's shoes off. Change your mind and get baptized into a new reality. The kingdom of God is at hand. Change your mind and get baptized into a new reality that my ministry must decrease and his ministry must increase. Can you see what John was doing? Come in here and I'm going to baptize you into a baptism of repentance. And everybody that came up out of the water, John gave him a list of instructions. You can go read this in the Gospels. Soldiers would come and get baptized. They'd say, what do we need to do? And he'd give them a list of instructions what to do. People, the average person would come and get baptized. And they'd say, what do I need to do? And he'd give them a list of what they needed to do. Why? Because his baptism was a baptism of repentance. Repentance is to change your mind. So what he was doing was he was immersing you into mind change. Change your mind. Let's change our minds, Israel. Now, here's what I think has happened. I think that what has happened over the years is that people have come into church and been immersed, that's baptized, Immer and I'm not just talking about getting into a baptistry anymore, I'm talking about immersion, being washed over with a, with a mindset. I think people are coming into the church and being immersed in the idea of change. They come and they sit in church and they hear preaching, and what do they hear? Change. Change your mind, change your tongue, change your clothes, change your haircut, change what you've been watching, change where you've been going, change what you do, change who you hang out with, change what you think, get, get out here and start to change. And they get immersed in a baptism of change. And when you get immersed in a baptism of change, you have just been immersed into a baptism of works. Because it now, from this moment forward, is all going to be about what you watch, what you wear, where you go, who you hang out with, what you talk, what you say, how you think. And church becomes miserable. I heard a, a testimony of someone this week who said, I, get, I almost get sick inside when I think about going to church. I almost get sick. And they weren't, this was a believer. This wasn't someone who's out here living like a dog. And they, get, they were going to a church and get beat up. There was somebody who was a believer that was going to church and just getting wore out all the time. Because it was always the change mentality. It was always the change mentality. And so I think what's happening is we're getting baptized in the idea of change. 
But Israel had come out of the idea. Let me, let me show you the closest thing we can find. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, that they all passed through the sea. Now, the cloud was the cloud by day. Remember when God walked in front of the Israelites when they left the land of Egypt? And they crossed through the Red Sea. Did they get, did they get actually... Let me say it right. When they got to the Red Sea, they crossed on dry ground, right? So they didn't actually get in the water. Are we, they didn't actually get in the water and swim the Red Sea. They just walked through on dry ground. Verse 2. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. This tells me that baptism, as they would use the word in the New Testament, does not always mean baptized in water. These people were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Did the, the children of Israel didn't even get wet in the Red Sea. They came through through dry ground, right? But they were being baptized. They were being emerged into Moses, emerged into the presence of that cloud, emerged into the reality of walking across that Red Sea on dry ground. I think this is what Jesus meant when he said, go ye into all the world and baptize all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. In other words, emerge people in a Trinitarian reality. Let them know they have a Father. Let them know they are a Son. Let them know they are led by the Spirit. Keep emerging people in this. Now, the Holy Spirit is the agency that happens in your life when you get saved that makes you who you are now that you're a believer. It's the Holy Spirit that does that work. And see, we, we have spent so much time arguing on timing of baptism, style of baptism, words said over you when you were baptized. But the truth is, is what the Holy Spirit did when you believed is He came into your heart. The moment that you first believed and you identified with what Jesus has done for you, you became, the Holy Spirit moved in. Now, your water baptism is that mental identification with that. It can come after the, the, that move of the Spirit. I, I think it could even come at your salvation. If you want to get back, if you, if you want part of your salvation to be, I, I believe and I want to be baptized right now, praise God. Because the Holy Spirit is the one doing the work. Here's an example. Peter and Paul are the pillars of our thinking of the early church. We think about the two top dogs. I know this is almost sacrilege just to say two top dogs. The two top dogs of the early church, Peter and Paul. And we think about their presentation of the gospel. Peter's primarily to the Jew. Paul's primarily to the Gentile. Uh, although they cross those boundaries more than once. And yet they're learning things apart from one another. Peter's over here and Paul's over here. They're in whole different co countries. And they're learning some of the same things. And yet, when you stack up their lessons that they're learning in the book of Acts, sometimes you'll get what seems to be a disparaging account. Let me give you an example. Peter goes into the house of Cornelius. Cornelius is an Italian. He, his whole family is Gentile. Peter didn't want to go, but he went because the Holy Spirit said, there's a guy going to come knock on your door, follow him. So Peter goes and follows him. He shows up at Cornelius' house. Cornelius and them are Gentiles who've been praying all week long. That means they've been seeking God through, a, through an old John the Baptist mentality. God, what do you want us to do to change? Peter walks in and begins to preach Jesus. And when he preaches Jesus in Acts chapter 10, he says, Jesus came to forgive us of all of our sins. And when he gets to that moment, the Holy Spirit falls in the room. Everybody in the room gets filled with the Holy Ghost. And they begin to speak in tongues. Now, don't get trapped on the tongues. This is where we sometimes we, we get messed up because people will read that and then they'll go, oh boy, here we go. We're going to get into stuff about tongues. We're, we're, I think we're getting confused at the wrong spot. Watch what happens next. Peter hears them speaking in tongues, and he says, they must have the Holy Ghost. Because they wouldn't be speaking in tongues, they have the Holy Ghost. Okay, so why don't we baptize them? And so he takes the whole group. Uh, is the group saved? Yeah. How do we know? Because they have the Holy Spirit. Not because they speak in tongues. That's not how you know you're saved. But the Holy Spirit's your identifier, that you're one with Jesus. And so these people all have the Holy Spirit, and Peter goes, well, let's go baptize them. Why? Because by baptizing them, he baptized them into the reality, their own identification, that we have this. Now, several hundred miles down the road, Paul, in the 19th chapter, is in Ephesus. This is Paul, not Peter. Paul shows up and meets a group of so-called believers. Now, they must be living in an odd way, because Paul asks them an odd question. In Acts 19, he says... Did you guys get the Holy Ghost? And they said, what are you talking about? Did we get the Holy Ghost? Now, in my Pentecostal heritage, we always preach that as Paul asking them, have you been baptized with the Holy Ghost now that you're a believer? That's not the way it's worded in the original Greek. 
It, 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 Paul wasn't asking, did you have another experience? Paul was asking, where's the Holy Spirit in your life? Which tells me they must have been living kind of shady. And so rather than dropping law on them, Paul goes, wait a minute, aren't you, why aren't you guys following the Holy Ghost? And their answer was, what are you talking about? We don't even know what the Holy Ghost is. And Paul goes, oh boy, how were you baptized? This is an interesting question by Paul. How were you baptized? And they said, we were baptized by John the Baptist's baptism. Now, what was John the Baptist's baptism? It was a baptism of change. It was a baptism of change your mind, now go out and change your attitude. Does it work? No, it doesn't make you change who you are. You change your mind, but you don't, your heart doesn't change. And so Paul says, wait a minute. I want you to be, I want to introduce you to Jesus. So he baptizes them into Jesus and then the Holy Spirit comes in and identifies in their life. I think the point the Holy Spirit is showing you is the water baptism is not what brought the Holy Spirit. Because in Acts 10, when Peter preaches to Cornelius, they already have the Holy Spirit before they're ever baptized. The water baptism is an identification for the person being baptized. And the moment Paul found out, wait a minute, you've never even been identified in Jesus? Let me baptize you by water because that's how a man gets identified in Jesus. So I believe there are people in the church who are believers, who understand the Word of God, but without water baptism, they're never going to walk into an identification of who they really are. They'll never walk into identification that they have been buried with Him in baptism. They've been raised up with Him in a newness of life. We were supposed to get that through baptism. A lot of us didn't get it through baptism. We took 20 years of Bible teaching to try to figure out who we are in Christ. So that's what a lot of our problem has been. I spent, I've spent years of my life trying to figure out who I am in Christ. I should have learned that when I got baptized. Why? Because when I got baptized, I should have been taught, now this is your identification moment. When you go down in this water, you're identifying that His death is your death. And when you come up out of these waters, you're a brand new creation. You say, I thought I was a new creation before I went in. You are, but you don't identify with it. It's your water baptism that causes us to identify with that moment. It's ideally what water baptism is. That's what it should do. It should identify us with having been placed into His death and then raised up into His resurrection and so that we can walk in a newness of life. Not slaves to sin. It's another reason I think some people are struggling so much with sin after they're converted because they were mentally they were just immersed into change. Come to church and change. Well, that, that doesn't work because they just go right back under the law. But they also don't have any identification that they're actually a new creation. And because they don't see themselves as a new creation, they think they should just keep fighting with sin. Are, you, are we on the same page today? You understand what I'm talking about? So why, why would I keep fighting with sin if I'm a new creation? My old creation's dead. A lot of us keep fighting with it because we don't think our old man is dead. Where were we supposed to learn that? Baptism. Why didn't we learn it? Maybe we weren't taught that when we were baptized. Maybe some weren't even baptized. Maybe you were baptized because they said that's what you do next. And you just got up there and they dunk you in a tank or in a river and you got up and went, well, that was good. That was part of my salvation. Praise God. And they don't really understand what that was supposed to represent. Now, why are we so adamant about communion, but not so adamant about baptism? So one thing that turned me on to this a few years ago is one of my, one of my sort of mentees in the message of grace contacted me one day a few years ago and said, help me with the significance of water baptism. And I was still under, trying to understand some of it myself. And I said, well, it's symbolic of what you did in Jesus. And they immediately replied and said, so is communion, but we believe that does something. And I went, ooh, good statement, good question. Symbolic, but we believe it does something. So if we're going to just say symbolic, why keep doing it if it doesn't do anything? Why don't we just get rid of it? Right? I mean, just, just, just kick it out. Doesn't mean anything. Just get rid of it. Well, we can't. Why can't we? We already got baptistries in our church. No, that's not the answer. <laughs> what are we going to do with that big tank? <laughs> that's not why we can't. We can't kick it out because it's all over the New Testament. The, 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 the church fathers keep dunking people. Philip's walking down the road, and here comes the Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot, and he's reading the book of Isaiah, and 
the, the, he says, Where, what are you reading? And he starts reading it back to him. It's Isaiah 53. It's Jesus. So Philip jumps up in the chariot and leads him to Christ. And they get to a river and the Ethiopian eunuch says, there's some water. What would forbid me from being baptized? And Philip says, nothing. Let's go. In some translations, Philip says, nothing except believing. And so they get down in the water and he baptizes them and boom, the, 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 the eunuch has an experience of identification. Now he met Jesus in the chariot. Wouldn't you say? That's the only reason he got out of the chariot to get in the water. Because he met Jesus in the chariot. But he wanted to identify with this death. When he saw water, he saw death. I, mean, I want to identify with what he did. So let's go over there and baptize me. I, I want to identify with what he did. And so what happens in the waters of baptism is an identification with what Jesus has done for you. And we take them down into the water and we bring them up. So in the next, second service today, when we have our water baptism, we're baptizing a young lady who's raised in a Christian family, and I've known her since the day before she was born. I've known her parents uh, years before she was born. She's been raised in nothing but grace. She doesn't know any. She's one of those grace babies. She's our next generation of, of people that are going to go, law? Uh, and thank God for them, you know. Uh, and, but, but her baptism, that's why we very much want to establish in these young people. It's not just a ceremony. It's not just, just a symbol. It's an identification not for me, but for you, if you're the one being baptized. Forget me. I mean, what do I, you're not doing nothing symbolic for me. Your life after this moment when you walk is going to say a whole lot more about who you are in Christ than your water baptism. I mean, if, you, if all you had was, well, didn't you see me get baptized? You should know I'm saved. Then you're probably not really living out Jesus. But you're, you're going to have plenty of chances to testify through your walk. But the water baptism is that moment for you. Now, I want to deal with one, before, as we head to the close, I want to deal with, with one of the passages that have caused us some consternation about the necessity of baptism. And I want to, I want to set our hearts at ease on Mark chapter 16. Chapter 16, Jesus says to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. This is not a backpedaling comment. It's just the reality. Okay? Mark chapter 16, if you're, if you're holding an NIV, if you're holding an uh, NRSV, if you're holding an ESV, if you're holding NASB, some of the other more recent translations, which by the way, just because it's a recent translation doesn't mean it's bad. In fact... Recent translations often are being done on the oldest discovered manuscripts. Some of your older translations were done on manuscripts that no scholar would use now because they're way too new. You, you, you know what I mean? Uh, not throwing stones at the King James, but the King James does use the newest Greek and Hebrew translations available to man, while some of your modern translation uses the oldest. It would be the equivalent of you finding a book about farming from the year 1900, and you want to know how they farmed in Thomas Jefferson's day. You know, so you might want to get your book farther back. You understand what I mean? That's a terrible illustration. I put zero thought into that. But that's better. It's better because you can go, well, that wouldn't work. You would want a little older one. You would want a little older one. You understand? So, so don't get disparaging because, well, it's a different translation. Um, but when you read something like the NIV and some of these others, they're heavy italicized slant in your text. Heavy slant. And a lot of the reasons, if you'll read in the footnotes, it'll tell you because from verse 9 through the end of Mark 16, from Mark 16, 9 through the end of the chapter are not in the oldest Greek translations. The oldest Greek manuscripts of the book of Mark end at Mark 16, 8. And some of the church fathers hated it because the eighth verse ends on kind of a low point. I mean, the women come to the tomb and don't believe. And then Mark stops writing. And we go, oh, gosh, we can't end the gospel with people coming to the tomb and not believing. That's a terrible way to end. And so over the years, as the Greek manuscripts got copied and copied and copied and copied, there started to be more verses tacked on to the end of Mark. Now, that doesn't mean, now the reason I said this isn't backpedaling, that doesn't mean they're not true. It just means that over the years they were added to. Some of, we got to understand the Gospels, it wasn't like Matthew sat down at his desk one day and wrote the book of Matthew and sealed it up and sent it out. That's not how it worked. It was an oral tradition 
that got copied over and over and over and over again until it became a version of the gospel known as Matthew, known as Mark, known as Luke, known as John. Okay? And so, in, in some cases, it may not even have been that guy that actually pushed the pen. It just may have been that guy that contributed majorly to the pushing of the pen, if you understand what I mean. So when you get to the end of Mark, we've got these added sections. Mark 16, 15, and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, but whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, was a, was a part that was added later. Now, I only say that because there's no way I can really in good conscience preach to you from Mark 16, 16 anymore and not say it. Because to me, to be a true student of the Bible, you need to study the Bible. And you need to study how it came about. Even with all of that said, let's say the Holy Spirit inspired this verse and it ended up in here because the Holy Spirit said it should have been in there in the first place. Even if that's the case, how do we deal with Mark 16, 16 that says, if you believe and you're baptized, you'll be saved. It sounds like you've got to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. But read on. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. He does not say whoever, is not believe, whoever does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned. The key to salvation, the key to no condemnation in this text is not the baptism. The key to no condemnation is believing. It was always the key to no condemnation. Your baptism was for your identification that you believe. But it was not for your no condemnation. You are not condemned because of the finished work of Jesus Christ and your belief in that finished work. The moment that you believed on Jesus, no condemnation. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3 that a man is condemned. He is condemned if he prefers the dark over the light. He had a chance and he preferred to not believe. He said there's condemnation on that guy. But for all who believe, there can be no condemnation. So if you believe and you're not baptized, you're not condemned. Why? Because you believed. What if you believe and you're not baptized though? You're not condemned. You're saved. But I say to you, you're not going to understand near as much of who you are in Christ without that baptism. And you may get there, but it could be a long journey in your life of trying to be convinced of who you are in Christ, that you're dead and then raised up in Christ. Died in Him, resurrected in Him. This is all a work of the Holy Spirit. Jessica, go back to my, first, my last 1 Corinthians text. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and we'll close. We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. Look, that was a spirit work. That wasn't a water work. That was a spirit work. You were baptized by one spirit to form one body, whether it's Jews or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. That's an interesting phrase to me. We were brought in through the Holy Spirit as one family, Jew and Gentile, bond and free, as one family, and then all of us keep drinking out of the same well, the wellspring of life. That was a spirit work. The moment that you believed, that was a spirit work. Your water baptism was to identify with that. Now, water baptism is not a once a month thing at Midland. We'll do it every week. If somebody comes up and says, I want to be baptized, we'll, oh, let's do it next Sunday, or in two weeks or three weeks, whatever they can do. Um, if in your spirit you don't feel like you ever had your moment of identification with the death and the resurrection of Jesus, I encourage you to be water baptized. You, you say, I've been saved 40 years, Pastor, but I never really had my identification in His death and His resurrection. And I've really struggled with that, Pastor. You need to be water baptized. And I, my whole philosophy on this change, if I see someone now who, who has no real recognition of their death and their resurrection in Christ, this is all about me needing to change, and it's not about He changes me, I highly recommend that they look into why the early church baptized people. Because it was for the person being baptized to have a recognition. So as you're growing in this grace, not in the grace message, you're growing in grace. As you're growing in grace, learning more about who you are, learning more about who He is in you, if you still feel, I, I'm not grasping with my spirit the identification of sonship, the identification that I died and I've been raised, then pray about water baptism. And then come see us and say, look, I know I'm a believer. I've been a believer this long, whatever. But I, I feel like there's something in water baptism that I need to understand, a revelation of my own death in Christ, my own resurrection in Christ. I want to walk in this new creation reality. 
and water baptism is that identifier for you. So c keep that in your heart and in your prayer. Okay, and the next time somebody wants to know what it means, you got a good place to start. And if it helps you, start with communion. Especially in a house like Midland, where communion has been, you've been saturated with the reality of communion. Start there. Say, what, why is communion important? And they'll tell you. Go, why isn't baptism that important? Should be. And when you understand what it is, I think you'll see that in your own heart as well. Heads, heads bowed, eyes closed. I just want to pray for somebody, anybody here watching around the world who needs the identification of sonship. And maybe it's a new believer. Maybe it's someone who's going to put their faith in Christ for the very first time today. And they need that understanding of what this is all about. What this message taught you was that when Jesus died, you died. Number two, it taught you that when you believed on that, you became justified by your faith. And number three, your water baptism was your identification with the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. So, the first one has happened, whether you like it or not. His death was your death. You have already been paid for. That is a done deal. The second one is up to you. Do you believe on Jesus and through that faith receive your justification? Well, if you do, then you are what we call a believer. Simple as that. Or what some people like to call saved or a Christian. Whatever you want to call it. They had a bunch of different names for it in the New Testament too. Whatever name you want to call it, the moment that you believed, you're justified by faith. Boom, you are justified by faith. Now that's a done deal. That's an eternal salvation. That is yours to have and to hold. It's also yours not to have and to hold. You don't have to hold on to it if you don't want to. I want you to identify with it. I want you to grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And water baptism is way and means by which we do that because we identify with the burial and the resurrection. So, Father, I'm praying for those who are having their first revelation today on that first point. He died for me. And, Father, that revelation hopefully leads them into the second one. I believe on that. I receive Jesus. Boom. There's their justification. Father, that work is your work. I don't know how to make it happen. I've tried to generate it before. I've tried to play with people's emotions. I've tried to get them to cry about it. And I've tried to get them to come forward and say a word, a prayer. And I've seen 85, 90% of those people leave, never come back, Lord. And I know in some cases we did more damage to them than we did good because all we did was toy with emotions. And I'm sick of that. I believe that if salvation is real, it's going to happen between you and them in their heart. Now, Father, I do firmly believe in your word is true, that if they believe by faith, they are justified. Now, Father, I want them to have a revelation of what it means to be a son or daughter. And for those struggling with that revelation, Father, may they consider water baptism, because your word tells us what that baptism identifies, that we go down into the grave and we come up in a newness of life. And I may have believers here, Lord, who've been saved for decades. They've never really identified with it. They've never really got it. May they consider by the revelation of the Holy Spirit water baptism as their moment of identification. That moment where they realize who they are in Christ. And may we, God, we break down the sort of American Midwestern stigma that getting baptized means you just got saved. Father, may we get past the silliness of what other people might think about us. And may we get serious about our own identification issues. Say, Lord, I want to be identif I want to identify with what your son did for me. And believe it. Father, this is a spirit work. Just as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, it's by the spirit that this work is done, that we're all drinking the same spiritual drink. So, Father, we receive that. We believe that. It's ours. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. If you're here or you're watching, and if you're watching us, this is where it becomes a little difficult from around the world. It's for people who are watching. They go, I want to be water baptized. And I'm living in wherever and then they're in Missouri, and I can take communion with them sitting at home by internet, but how do I get water baptized? Um, go get baptized. How do I do that? Doesn't somebody have to do it? No. Why? Your salvation is between you and Jesus. So is your identification. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Just be led of the Spirit. If you've got, you got a friend and you feel better about somebody else putting you under the water and bringing you up, praise God. It's their identification. It's not a magic ceremony. It's not got to be done in a certain room. You've got to say three scriptures over it. It's an identification moment for you. Go be baptized. Baptize yourself. You take communion by yourself. You're a king and a priest. You're a believer on Jesus. I'll give the one disclaimer that always came out in every baptism sermon I ever heard, which was, if you're not, if you're not a believer, you're just getting wet. I'll give that disclaimer if need be. If you're not a believer, it is, it's a bath. But if you're a believer, it's an identification bath. It's an identification of who you are in Christ. 
And if that be the case, go under the waters of baptism and believe exactly what the Word says about you. That you died with Him and that you raised with Him in a newness of life. And when you come up out of that water, that's your moment of identification. Don't ever forget it. It's yours forever. This is not a baptism of repentance. It's not a baptism of just keep changing your mind. Change, 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 change every week. That's you going out and working. This is a baptism of He has done the work and I am in His work. I'm in His grave and I'm raised up with Him. And that's good news. That's good news. If you're at Midland, we would love to be a part of your baptism because we love to celebrate it as a family the same way as we love to celebrate communion as a family. We realize that you can take communion at home, but we would love to celebrate baptism with you. So find us, see us, talk to us. We'd love to be a part of that with you. Would you stand? What a good day to be in the house with my friends and my family. So glad you were here today. Letting you out a little bit early today, too. I noticed that I uh, did not preach as long today. Don't get used to that. <laughs> don't, get, don't get too accustomed to the shorter versions. Uh, but no, it's been good. And I hope, I, I hope you'll consider this message and roll it over in your spirit. And if it's, if it's you that, that, that would like to talk to us, please do. We, we want to talk to you about baptism. Let's pray favor. And then I want you to have an awesome week in the Lord Jesus. Father, turn your face upon us at Midland and our friends all over the world. Turn your countenance upon us. Grant us grace. Grant us peace. Father, we are your blessed. We are your favored. We are your loved. We are your kids. We are your family. We are joint heirs with what you have given to your son, Jesus. So, Father, we receive all of the favor and all of the grace that he paid for. We can't pay for it. We won't pay for it. That would make it a paycheck. We want favor. Unmerited, undeserved, and unearned without limits. Because the word says in Romans 5, 17, if we receive abundant grace, we will reign in life through Jesus Christ. That means it's ours, so we take it. We're going we're gonna to reign this week in Christ Jesus with the identity that it belongs to us. And we receive it right now for every area in Jesus' name. And everybody seal it with your amen. The number five is widely regarded as the Hebrew number that represents God's grace. It is no coincidence that there are exactly five women named in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus found in the first book of the New Testament. Each of these five women represent God's grace and favor in various ways and at different times in our own lives. Pastor Paul White delivers five sermons in this series covering the stories of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. This series is available to you for only $20 plus shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. I'm to introduce Pastor Paul White's newest book titled Between the Pieces, What Really Happened at the Cross. This behind-the-scenes look at history's greatest event will take you on a fascinating study into the awesome power of Christ's finished work. Order your copy of Between the Pieces today for only $15 plus $3 shipping. You can pay by credit card by visiting us at www.paulwhiteministries.org or by calling our offices at 1-877-244-3353. To pay by check, send your order to Paul White Ministries, P.O. Box 985, Poplar Bluff, Missouri, 63902 by the term salvation. And what are some ways to effectively share your faith with others? Pastor Paul White was recently asked to submit six 30-minute sermons aimed at an audience of unbelievers in order to introduce them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. These sermons are currently airing on an international Christian satellite network with a potential audience of over one billion people. Now you can own these six sermons on DVD as study tools for effective evangelism or share them with friends and loved ones who need to hear the good news about God's love and Christ's sacrifice. This six DVD set can be yours for only $30 plus $5 shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or order online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. For more information about Paul White Ministries and how you can become one of Paul's partners, visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. That's www.paulwhiteministries.org. Have a blessed day and may God richly bless you.